the Z transform um, and lead into filtering, so very basic FIR, finite impulse response filters. Um, so the Z transform is an extension or a, uh, sort of a generalization of the discrete Fourier transform. So you'll see if you took a lot of Fourier transforms, you'll end up with these e to the j omega t components that are, are um, terms which are common um, to all of the equations. And you could probably just replace it with a letter Z, and then you get the Z transform. But the power of it is, uh, well, besides the notational convenience, is you don't have to, um, well, yeah, you don't have to carry the, the terms around, but you'll see some insights later when we look at poles and zeros and the behavior of the, f the filter, we'll be able to predict it by looking at the difference equation and how the filter will, will behave. So we'll see that, see that next week. Um, just to give you a, a run into this, I want to talk about impulse response. Um, so it seems like we're, we're starting a bit off topic, but we're going to go back to continuous systems and talk about impulse response and convolution because that's how digital filters are going to be implemented as a discrete time convolution. Um, so I'll ask you a question. So if the input to a system is an impulse, which by that I mean a delta function, um, what is the output? It's almost a trick question in a way. So have you done this stuff with Robert already? <laughs> Four weeks ago. Might as well have been the distant past. Um, well the answer is it's called the impulse response, yeah. So when we want to capture the, the essence of of a system, a continuous system, an analog system in um, the time domain, uh, that what captures it is what by definition is the impulse response. And I'll explain to you why that's the most basic way to represent the function in the time domain. In, in the frequency domain, you, you might have a, it's the plus transform or Fourier transform, um, but in time domain, it's the impulse response. So, uh, for example, we have a a system, a linear system, which has an impulse response h of t, so we'll describe the system by its impulse response. I could have written a transfer function there or something, or a Laplace transform, but in this case we're, we're concerned with its time domain behavior. And the input, which is a function of time, will be an impulse. So this is at t equals to zero. I've got my delta of t, so maybe x of t, which is the input, equals delta of t. And what is the output going to be? Well, it's just some examples. So I'm going to draw some typical response, which might be a decaying uh, sinusoidal, uh, exponentially decaying sort of waveform. So maybe the output will look something like this. So the output y of t, which in this case is equal to h of t by definition, because the input is a, is a delta function, a, an impulse. And maybe it will look like this or something, or, and so on. So why do this? Why do this? Well, let's build the complexity up a little bit. So now I'll say consider a situation where rather than one impulse to get the impulse response, we have two impulses which are separated uh, in time. Let's watch the camera there. So let's draw against time. So this is my function x of t. And maybe it uh, has one impulse here, like that, and another one here. This one at t1, and this one at t2. Well, what will the output of the system be if that's the input? Well, imagine for a moment that the second impulse isn't there. What will the output of the system be? Well, it's not going to do anything for the first t1 second, so we're going to get zero for that period of time. 
And then the impulse enters the system and by definition uh, the system will respond with its impulse response at that time. And then really that's it until it starts to get interesting when the second impulse arrives. So we could draw, if, if the impulse response was what we showed on the previous page, um, I'll draw it below. Um, let's change color. So we should get zero until this point and then the system will kick off into what was a sinusoidal response like this. And that will continue forevermore in the background. And so I'm going to draw it so maybe it's some decaying response like that. And away it goes. So that's because of this input, T1. And now it gets messy. So then the second impulse will arrive and that will kick the system and the system will again respond with its impulse response but superimposed on, upon its, the, the ongoing response from the first impulse. So I'll get, again draw um, the, the response due to this thing which will go to here and then it will kick off and do the same thing. And the result, which is going to be hard for me to draw, um, let's do it in orange, will be I think we should move to a new... The result is going to be something like... Well, I've got to add these together, so it's going to be that part, and then you get... This one goes up again like this, and so on it goes. It gets a bit messy. So this is a superposition of... Um, you're going to have the first impulse response, but it's delayed, it doesn't start until T1, so in order to delay or shift to the right we subtract minus T1 and then we have the impulse response once again but delayed to T2 and that's the answer for why. Now the reason I'm showing you two different impulses separated like that is to first get into your head the idea that the impulse response superimposes upon itself. So if I give it one, one part of the input, it does something. If I give it some other input later on, it'll do the same thing again, scale depending on, on the area under each of these. So I've drawn the boat to be maybe a value of one. Well, I have in this case, not maybe. Um, the area under each of these impulses is one in this case. They didn't have to be. They could be different, different height values. Um, and I would scale the response accordingly depending on, on uh, the height of the impulse. And the reason I'm working towards this is now imagine that rather than two impulses, maybe I have a continuum of impulses. So I fill in all the spaces in between and that is an input signal. So you can always decompose an input signal into an infinite continuum of impulses and then you can anticipate what the result would be um, based on the example that we've shown here. So in general, um, so what if x of t is continuous? Then we will get y of t is equal to well, let's just write down, I'm, uh, I'm going to jump over a little piece and just write this bit down. Now that's very similar to... Let's wait till you get out of the way of the camera. That's very similar to what we had on the previous slide. Um, so I had two of these terms. I had one impulse at tau, maybe T1, another impulse at T2. So you can see I might want to have a whole bunch of these terms and add them all together. And the way to do that for continuous time is to do an, an integral. So Sorry, detail. So let's go back one page and I'll show you what I mean. So here I had, even though it's, it's written 1, it's actually x of t at that time t1, which is, has a value of 1, the area under that impulse is 1, so 1 goes in here, so it would have been a 1 in there, and then 
x of t at t2. Its value is 1 multiplied by the impulse response, so there would have been a 1 in here as well. Um, so you would have had x of t1 by h of t minus t1 plus x at t2 times h of t minus t2. And we end up summing across all of the input, input signal like this. Um, and that's the way to write it in the continuous time domain. So tau is a summing variable. I'm scanning across the input signal, pretending that at any, any point, any tau value, that the input signal is an impulse, and then I get its impulse response at that time. And the full super, superposition of all of those um, responses is given by the interval. So that's for continuous time. And we know from the convolution theorem, well, this is, well, this is written. So you've seen this already, the convolution operator. So that's when, when you see this, this is what's happening. We're com doing a convolution between the input signal and the system impulse response. Um, and then by convolution theorem, we know that this can give us So these are all Fourier transforms. So Robert's taking through all this stuff. We're just revising linear systems, uh, continuous time uh, linear systems. So we have convolution theorem, and then this is, gives us multiplication in the frequency domain. So we have some Laplace transform or Fourier transform. We can get that the input signal. We take its transform, multiply it by the transform of the, the impulse response. Um, we get the transform of the output. And this is a more convenient way to, I mean, convolution is messy. It's, it's quite ugly and difficult to do. But in frequency domain, everything is very simple. It's multiplication. Now, what we want to do is move into discrete time. So here we are returning back to the main thrust of the lecture. We want to get back to discrete time and get something that looks like this. This is where we want to get to. So we're going to have a digital filter that won't look too different to this. It'll be discrete in time, so we'll go along in, in steps, uh, sample intervals. And we want to get something that looks like this. It's a way to, to represent the frequency behavior of, of a digital system, not a continuous system. So it's just a bit of a setup to t remind you what convolution is, because you're going to see it. Every filter that we write, when we implement it, we're going to implement a discrete time convolution. Um, so let's do an example of that now. And then we'll move on and talk about the Z-transform, which is a way to analyze these uh, discrete time systems. So you've just had me talk about uh, continuous time convolution, now we're going to do discrete time convolution. We'll go, basically, I'm going to draw on the page a filter. A fi we're going to filter a digital signal. Um, and it, it's not going to be incredibly illuminating. It'll just go through the, the mechanical process of it. Um, and later on, we'll, we'll understand a bit more about the filter. We would have been able to predict, actually, how, how it will behave. So perhaps we have uh, an example. I have some input signal, it's called x of n. I think it might be written f of n in the notes, that doesn't matter. Input. And it has a value of one, two, three, four. 0, 1, 2, and 3. So this is our input signal. Now what is the filter? <coughs> this is somewhat arbitrary, um, but I'm going to pick something that looks like this.
1, 2, minus 2, minus 1. And that's at zero, uh, values of n of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Now, the discrete time equivalent of convolution is, um, we write it down here, let's have the output, call it y of n, is equal to the sum j equal to minus infinity to infinity. h of j, x of n minus j. I just want to show you yeah, H of I'm just going to write down the, oh, hang on pound protectors moved there we go I'm just going to write this down and we'll, we'll come back to this um, Yeah, that's right. Now, this is typically the way that we'll implement a filter, a digital filter. So we'll have some signal and we'll take delayed versions of the input. So we'll take the, the most recent sample and the sample before that and the sample before that and so on. And we'll weight it against with some, so it's a weighted sum. And we'll, so we'll weight it with these uh, coefficients, filter coefficients. Now that doesn't really look like convolution as you're used to it. First of all, I know it's discrete in time. We're doing a summation instead of an integral, but um, you can show very, very easily with a change of variable that that infinite sum is the same as this sum, and all I've done is be, been able to switch around these variables. So it's not the same j, but you get the idea. Um, and this looks like where we have the, the impulse response um, at n minus tau, whatever that was, it's a shifting to the right uh, multiplied by the input signal at whatever value. And that's what was on. I'll just go back a page and show you. Um, that's really what that looks like in continuous time. So I have the input signal, some value, uh, and a shifted version of the impulse response delayed in time. So it's no surprise that the discrete convolution looks almost exactly the same, except we don't only have values at the points in time where we sample. Um, so we get something that looks like this. So let's go through the mechanics of doing this. Um, uh, maybe I'll just write it out for this example. Um, just to show you what that equation looks like expanded. So we're going to have y of n is equal to... Um, this has no value for, for n not equal to 0, 1, 2, or 3, and the same for the other one. So that infinite sum becomes a very a finite sum, uh, which is going to be... Um, Let's do it this way. Yeah, let's do it this way. So it's going to be x of 0, h of n, Sorry, those H's and N's are starting to look like each other. That's this uh, this version of the equation. Now, we don't normally implement it like that, but just for educational purposes, I want to show you that this really is a shifting of an impulse response in time and scaling, and then a superposition of all of those responses. So it's about understanding the, you know, intuitively understanding how the filter ha works. In practice, we'll implement it in this way here. We'll just have some taps and we'll multiply them by the inputs, uh, input values of the signal and delayed values. Uh, so what's this going to look like? Well, let, let's build up each of these terms. So we'll do um, the, the x0 h of n term, and then we'll do the next one, and we'll line them all up and add them together. That's a little bit tedious, um, but I think it's worthwhile. So the first term in the sequence was 
x of 0, h of n, and h of n was, yeah, just to remind you, so x of 0 is going to be x when n is equal to 0, it takes the value of 1, multiplied by the impulse response, which is this. So we're just going to get the impulse response kicking off at that point in time. which is 1, 2, minus 2, minus 1. And the next term the next term in the sequence is the response of the system to the next input value, which is x1. So it will respond again with its impulse response, scaled by the value of x1 and delayed to that point in time because that's when x1 arrives. So x1 arrives when n is equal to 1. Um, x1 is equal to 2. The input signal is chosen to be quite simple so you can remember it as we go on. So the next value is 2 and then it will be 3 and then it will be 4. Okay. So everything is going to be shifted out to here. It's not drawn to scale, so I'll just draw it. It'll look the same. So we now have 2, 4, minus 4, minus 2. The next one, x of 2, h of n minus 2, shifted to the right by two samples. So we're going to get an x of 2 is takes the value of 3, so it's going to be 3, 6, minus 6, minus 3. So you can see it's getting a bit boring now, so we really would like a computer to come and help us finish the job. And 3, 6, minus 6, minus 3. And the next value, the last value, will be x3, h of n minus 3. So it's going to be out here, and it's going to go, um, what's, that's the value of 4, so it's going to be 4, 8, minus 8, sorry, minus 4. Now the final answer is going to be this superposition of all of those. So my y of n. And you line them up in time and add them together. So the first value is going to be 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. The next value is 2 plus 2 plus 0 plus 0 is 4. So we're going to get 1, 4. What's the next one? Is minus 2 plus 4 is, is plus 2. Plus 3 is 5 plus 0 is 5. And so on. And that's how you generate them. So all I'm trying to show you here is that it is a similar concept to convolution in, in continuous time where we have this, it's actually more simple to be honest because we move along in discrete time steps whereas in continuous time it gets confusing because you have this integral and you're trying to imagine a continuum of impulses. Uh, this is much more simple. We have an input which comes along this value here, the system responds with some impulse response. The next input comes along, the system responds with a scaled version of the impulse response and they all add together. Now as I say, that's not the way, you'll still get the right answer. If you want to implement a filter like this, then you will get the correct answer, but that's not how we do it. Uh, we use the other version of the function where we just weight the, the inputs uh, and we get the same answer. So. Okay, so now we talked about uh, a bit of revision about linear systems, continuous time, so convolution, multiplication. An example of discrete time uh, convolution. And now we're going to talk about how we would analyze and understand the frequency or predict the frequency response of these discrete time systems. And that's where the Z-transform comes in very useful.
Now the Zed Transform, I remember the first time I came into contact with it, it was absolutely terrifying. I don't know what, what it was about it that was so scary. It just looked a little bit foreign and alien. Um, I think very quickly you realize it's, it's probably easier to deal with than some of the other transforms. Um, so I just want to give you the motivation for it. Um, so just a reminder for continuous time. We use the Fourier transform or the PLAS transform, depends on what you're after. If you want the steady state response, you go for Fourier transform um, or Laplace transform for a general response. Then last week we did discrete time. Uh, so discrete. We had the discrete time for a transform, um, or we can use the Z transform, which we'll talk about now. So all I'll say is the Z transform is This is probably an understatement, but I'm telling you that the Z transform, to try to not scare you, is a, is a notational convenience. And I'll, I'll write down two equations and straight away you'll go, bing, I see it, I understand. Um, but the value of it is that we, besides the notational convenience, is we get some really deep insight into the way digital systems behave based on the roots, the poles. So the same way with the plus transform, you could predict how a filter will behave in continuous time. With the Z transform, we find the poles and zeros of, the, of this transfer function, and we will be able to predict how the, how the filter will behave. So just to prove to you that it's, it is a notational convenience, we'll start with the definition. This is the part where you get scared. Now we need, we've had too many transforms, right? So we need something to tell us that this is a different transform yet again. So we've used, um, I think it was um, F of, and we, you'll see J omega in here, which is implicit that you're talking about a Fourier transform. And then we were writing uh, F with a bar on top and J omega, and that was telling us it was discrete time Fourier transform, so the, the, the Fourier transform of, it, of a sample signal. And now we're going to talk about a Z transform, which is something a little bit different again. So we need some sort of notation to tell us that we are, it's, it's a different beast. So I use tilde, some books write the tilde underneath, uh, some books use something else, some books just have it that you'll see whatever goes in here gives it away, um, but we just need some way to know that we're talking about Z transforms and not Fourier transforms. So no surprise, there is an infinite sum, just like the discrete time Fourier transform had, because we have an infinite, we could have an infinite number of samples, and f of n would be the sample signal that we care about, and then we just write z to the power of minus n, and that's it. And z is complex, complex variable. And then I'll just remind you that the discrete time for a transform looked like this. J omega. <coughs> e to the minus J omega and T. So do these two look like each other? Yeah, they're almost identical. And the common, don't want to say denominator, but um, the relationship is that Z is equal to e to the j omega t for the dtft. So if, you had, if I gave you a Z transform and I said, you know, the, here are the samples of a signal, we've calculated the Z transform, please tell me what the spectrum of the signal is, you'll say no problem, all I'll do is everywhere I see a Z, I'll substitute in e to the power of j omega t, and I will have the answer. And that's it. So, 
at first glance, it, it's just a notational convenience because whenever I write a discrete time Fourier transform, I'm, I, I get tired very quickly of writing down e to the j omega t when it's pretty much, if I pick a, a frequency I care about, e to the j omega t is a constant from that point on. Um, so why do I even need to write it over and over? I just write z and that's it. So just to reinforce that, discrete time for a transform, which we write as f bar j omega, <coughs> is equal to the z transform of a bunch of samples with z equal to e to the j omega t. And let's just write it explicitly. Wouldn't mind to press the aircon over there. It's going to be a hot up here. Thanks. Okay, so you, you'll tend to see this in a lot of uh, digital signal processing textbooks, this type of notation where we have e to the j omega t. So that's the giveaway that you're in talking about digital signals. You're taking a z transform, you want the spectrum of the signal. Um, just a bit about notation, I think I should mention here. Um, some, it is confusing. Some textbooks write omega, and what they mean is omega t, and they write omega when what they mean is omega. Now, the reason for that is just unfortunate for you if you're new to the new to the subject that you'd have to put up with that uh, discrep. I don't know what to call it, but it's a uh, uh, the fact that. It's a lack of harmonization and notation. The reason it's done is that once the sampling interval is set in the system, usually we don't change it. So we, we pick we're going to sample at 5,000 hertz or whatever it might be, and then that sample interval t is fixed. So rather than write omega t all the time, you might as well just write omega. So this is called a normalized or digital frequency. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to use it here. So when you see me write omega, I mean omega, the real frequency, not the scale, digital frequency. So this can be a little bit confusing when you pick up a textbook and you see a lot of, instead of e to the j omega t, you see e to the j omega. What they mean is and a t multiplied on. Okay, let's do an example. Now this is trivial, but I just want to reinforce that there's no magic happening here. Um, so maybe we have a sequence which is looks like this. Um, just making this up. So maybe 1, 2, 1, 0 0.5, 1.5. And it is important where we are in time because we'll see, I'll talk about properties and shifting. Um, that we need to know where we are, so maybe this is n equal to zero here, and then this is you know one, one, two, minus one, minus two. So what would the z transform be? Well, all you do is you take each of the samples of the signal and you multiply them by z to the minus whatever the index is. So in this case here, it's going to be um, one by z to the minus zero. And here it will be 0.5 by z to the minus one. So if you want to help yourself remember, just write them down below. So you'll have z to the minus two, to the minus minus two, which is plus two, z to the minus minus one, which is plus one, <coughs> plus one, z to the minus zero, <coughs> excuse me, z to the minus one, z to the minus two and then multiply them out. So the, the Z-transform uh, of this guy will be... So we're going to get 1, Z to plus 2, uh, plus 2, Z to the plus 1, plus 1 times Z to the 0, which is 1, uh, plus 0.5 times Z to the minus 1, Uh, plus 1.5 z to the minus 2. So, 
nothing spectacular, we're just implementing it. Um, we'll come back and do some more slightly complicated examples uh, a bit later on. Let's just talk about some of the properties first. I don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about this. It is important and it's in the notes. You can go and have a read about it. And you, you won't be surprised to see most of them are the same as all the other linear transforms. So things like shifting, linearity. Um, so we'll just scribble some of them down quickly. Um, linearity, which means that if I give you the transform of one signal and the transform of another signal, and if you add the two signals together, you get the, the, tr the resulting transform is um, the addition of the, trans the two transforms. So you get A times, imagine, F of N plus maybe B times G of N. So I've got two superposition of sorts of two different sa signals, which are sampled. Um, then the transforms add in the same way. So I have A, F of Z, plus B, G of Z. Now you might think that's not very useful, but this kind of stuff is used all the time in, when you do proofs and that, so you don't need to know. If I knew what the transform of this was and the transform of that one was, I don't really need to do very much work to get the final transform. It's just a, a, a by linearity they, they, add, they add together with a weighting. This one is important, um, shifting. It's very, very similar, you, well, it's, it's identical really to um, a delay for Fourier transform. Um, it's just that we have a Z instead of an E to the J omega T now. So, um, so if I have F of N minus K, which is a shift to the right, a delay, it's a delay by K samples, that will go to be the transform of f of n multiplied by z to minus k. It's very easy to prove that if you go back to the definition and you do some variable substitutions, you realize that, oh, there it is. Um, if I took the transform of this, I would end up with the transform of f of n, which is the signal not shifted, multiplied by z to the minus k. So this is very, it's important, the reason I say it's important is because this pops up all over the place. Every time you see a z to the minus something, it means the sample's being delayed, something's being delayed, shifted to the right by k samples. We've already talked about, so we talked about linearity, shifting, um, the DTFT, which I don't really need to labor, but z equals e to the j omega t gives three times for a transform. Um, something that, just to mention, if you look at this variable, so we have this z transform, which is f of z equals something. It's a function of z, so we can put a value of z in and get an answer. But if you want <coughs> important answers, the values of z that you put in are e to the j omega t. Now where are those values of z on the z plane, the complex plane? What is the locus of e to the j omega t? So you, if you use the Euler formula, what do you get? e to the j omega t cos of omega t plus j sine of omega t. So cos and sine give you a circle. A very badly drawn circle, but this would be some point z equal to e to the j omega t. This is the real part of z. This is the imaginary part of Z. So that's the first time you'll see this now if you've never done this topic before. The, what was for continuous systems, you had um, the S-plane. I don't know if you've seen these diagrams. The S-plane and you have the imaginary axis which runs right from top to bottom and along that axis is where you get the steady state response of a continuous time system. In for digital systems, the, the the locus of interest where we get the frequency response is on this unit circle in the z-plane. So it's quite different. And the nature of the circle is almost expected because we know that the Fourier transform of a sample signal is periodic. So we should be coming back on our tails again and again to see the same thing over and over. And that's what a circle gives us. So when we go around the circle once, we end up back here, we're back to a multiple of the sampling frequency and we go around again and so it goes. Um, 
And the last one, discrete convolution, I'm not going to prove, but it's very, very important. Um, so convolution. So we have, um, if I had something g of n is equal to this infinite sums, this is the implementation of a filter for minus infinity to infinity multiplied by the weights of the filter, with the, whatever they were. Um, let's write f, uh, f of n minus j. And that's the input signal. Then, and you, you can see this coming. So lo and behold, if we had a convolution in one domain, in the other domain, it's multiplication. So if I know the Z-transform of an input signal, and I know the Z-transform of the impulse response of the system, I can tell you what the Z-transform of the output is going to be. Now, I've got a few examples to do. I'll probably skip over parts of them, and then um, we're going to do take the Z transform and give you an introduction to digital filters, and that's what the laboratory is going to be uh, based around. So I don't I, I, apologies if I can't remember whether I asked you to implement the filter or not. Um, I think I might actually. Yeah, you do. Um, but I'm going to ask you to also predict what the behavior of the filter will be. So we're going to use the Z transform uh, evaluated on the unit circle to do that. Um, so before we get to that point, I'm just going to give you some examples of Z, trans Z transforms of um, and inverse Z transforms. Okay. So here's an interesting one, and it's not chosen by accident. So we have a case statement, because we wanted to find a range for n, and we have maybe these, this signal f of n is equal to c of n, um, sorry, that's a mistake, I'm just going to, small typo, doesn't make sense, to the power of n, if I could write it. c to the power of n for all values where n is greater than zero and otherwise it's, it's zero. So it does nothing for all time until that, when time equals zero, we start and it takes on the value c to the power of n. Now you can probably predict already what the behavior of such a signal will be depending on the value of c that you chose. So if c is greater than zero, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And if c is less than, sorry, one. If it's greater than one, it's going to get bigger and bigger. And if it's less than one, it's going to decay away to zero. Um, so this value of c is important. Uh, we'll come back to that. What's the Z-transform? It's the infinite sum. We just plug in the numbers of the function. I shouldn't say from I sh shouldn't say from minus infinity because it doesn't have any value for n less than zero. So it's only from zero. C to the power of n. C to the power of minus n. So that is the Z transform of that function. Um, it doesn't look like it's easy to interpret because we have an infinite sum. So we're going to dip into uh, our complex analysis and pull out a trick um, from the geometric series. This is kind of an aside, but. Um, the infinite sum of n equal to zero 
to infinity of x to the power of n is equal to 1 over 1 minus x if, so long as the magnitude of x is less than 1. So if you ever have an infinite series that looks like this, where you've got going from zero to infinity, something to the power of n, so long as that something has a magnitude of, of less than one, uh, you, it will converge, and you can write it down as uh, one over one minus x. So it's a neat trick. Uh, so we get f of z equal to 1 over 1 minus c z to the minus 1 and that's when so we want this whole thing to be less than 1 in its magnitude um, and it turns out that that's when the magnitude of c is less than z now why is that important we'll, we'll see Later on, um, I'll tell you about it, a bit more about it next week when we design filters for infinite impulse response filters where they have transfer functions which have factors, poles, on the bottom like this. Um, and we'll see that each pole contributes something to the response, the impulse response, and the amplitude of that response will be governed by the value of this, this C. And if the C is less than 1, the magnitude of that value C is less than 1, then the response to some impulse input to the system, it will convert. It will settle back to zero. It will converge. But if it's if the C value is greater than one, then it will it will diverge, and the thing will go out of control. Um, so that's why we, you'll hear people say, it's just known when you design an analog filter, you've got to make sure your poles are in the left half plane. I don't know if Robert touched on any of that stuff with you. So if you've got a, 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 an analog system and you look at its Laplace transform, if you look at the impulse response of that system, it will be stable, so it will decay back to zero, so long as all of its poles are in the left half plane. So you, you get a decaying exponential in the time domain. For digital systems, you get stable be behavior in a system so long as all of the poles are inside the unit circle. This thing, C, defines the location of the pole, and as long as that's inside the unit circle, then it will be stable, guaranteed. That's the only thing we worry about when we design digital filters, particularly, well, infinite impulse response. Um, they can become unstable if we don't have that property. Okay, let's do, yeah, one special case will be if C is equal to one, we get a unit step, it's a special type of function. Um, so it's often written as u, u of n. It's a very special type of function which just does nothing for all time and then becomes 1. Um, so it's 0 is all the way back here and then it jumps up to 1 forevermore. And it's said transform, therefore, is 1 over 1 minus z to minus 1. So that is marginally stable as a system. It is teetering on the edge of becoming unstable, um, just going along the flat line of value of 1. Okay, let's think about inverse transforms now. Well, I'll write it down and I'll tell you that we never use, I've never used it. <coughs> if you go to a maths book and ask what's the inverse z transform, this is what you'll get. It's the integral around the closed curve in the z plane um, multiplied by 1 over 2j pi. Um, so we don't do that. We don't do it this way. I've never used it. Um, so in practice, 
well, all I can say is be, be clever. So here's an example. There's quite a lot of tables, you'll find them online, so some people have sat down and worked out a whole bunch of transforms and inverse transforms, so for, for very common signals that we come into contact with. Um, so oftentimes, if, you, if I give you something like um, maybe the Z transform of a signal or a system is 1 over Z plus 1.2, you would go off to the tables and look for something which looks like that, and then you could write down the transform off the back of it. Um, not always the case, you might have to do some algebraic manipulation to make it look like what's in the tables and then you can write it down. We're just going to do it from first principles. So let's multiply top and bottom by z to minus 1. Now the reason I've done this is because in the previous example I had a term 1 over 1 plus c, j, uh, c to the minus 1 and that's sort of what I'm trying to get, get at here. So we can have z to the minus 1, let's just pull that out in front, 1 over 1 plus 1.2 z to the minus 1. Now. We basically started our own set of tables on the last slide because we did this inverse set transform of something which looks like this. Um, so we have, let's jump in, we have x of n is equal to, now I'm going to write something down and I'm going to correct it. So you might think, well, forget about this term, the z to the minus 1, this bit we've just dealt with. So that is the transform of 1.2 to the power of n. Otherwise, zero. <coughs> However, this z to the minus 1 term from the shifting theorem Remember previously I said that if, if you had z to the minus k, it's equivalent to shifting to the, the original signal being shifted to the right, delayed in time, which means that this signal was actually delayed before I took the transform. So I needed an n to the minus 1 up here. And so that's for n greater than or equal to 0. I wonder should it even be n equal to 1? How to think about it. Um, okay, so if you go to, I think in the notes I've done some plots for you, you can see um, what this function is going to look like against time, or sample time, sample interval. Here's another example. Sorry. 2z minus 1. Now, there are two different ways to do this. The first one, anybody want to hazard a guess? Partial fractions, somebody said, yep. So the first one, you got partial fractions. Um, you see similar things with Laplace transforms. When you want to do the inverse transform, you break it up by partial fractions. Um, you can do it as an exercise, but you should get... Some of them are tricky, actually. I remember doing partial fractions way back when, and yeah, sometimes you got to guess the right form or it won't work. Um, or over... So if you do partial fraction expansion, you'll end up with this, and then you could pull out the z to the minus 1, you end up with 1, minus 
Z over Z minus 1 minus 2Z over Z minus 0 0.5. And if you were feeling lazy, you'd head off to the tables and you well, you recognize that's going to be a delay, so we'll deal with that later. Um, what do we get? This is going to be an impulse. <coughs> Why is that the case? What signal has a Z-transform of 1? So remember what Z-transform is. You line all the samples up and you multiply them by Z to the power of something you know, all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. The only time you'll ever get no z afterwards is when n is equal to zero. So it's z to the power of zero is one. And the value of the signal at that point was one. So that's obviously a delta function. There couldn't be anything else. So that's going to be an impulse or delta. Um, from the tables, we'll find out this is um, a unit step. You would have seen it on the previous slide. Um, and this is something else. So the answer that we get without the delay is x of n equal to d of n, the delta, go away, plus a unit step, u of n, minus, now this is from the tables, 0.5, power of n by unit step. That's all delayed. So you'd have to write it down again. So you'd have delta of n minus 1 plus u of n minus 1 minus 2 0 0.5 to the power of n minus 1 by u of n minus 1. Alright, so that's one way to go about it. Um, how's it going to behave? Well, we're going to get, when n is equal to 0, let's say n equal to 1 where it gets interesting, the delta will spike, the unit step will kick in, that gives us 2, 1 plus 1 is 2, and um, we'll have um, this u of n will kick in, so we'll have a 1, um, to the power of zero, it's going to give us minus two. We're going to get zero actually at that point, and then it will. What will happen? The unit step will persist. The delta function will go away, and this thing here will decay with time. So we're going to have, um, in the long run, a DC value of one, and there'll be a, a decaying transient at the beginning, like an exponential decay. The other way to go about it, I'm not going to go through it. It's it's laborious. Um, but if you, you didn't have any tricks up your sleeve, it would have been to do uh, long division. So 2 minus 3z to the minus 1. If you multiply it all out, plus z to the minus 2 into 1. Well, I tell a lie. It's into z to the power 3 minus 3. If you multiply the denominator out and divide top and bottom by z to the power of minus 3, this is what you get. You can just take this term away and do that, and just do division into 1, and you get the answer. And long division, yeah, it's, it'll work. The problem is you won't get a close form for this. You'll just start generating the numbers in the sequence, and it's an infinite impulse response. It'll go on forever. So you'll just generate the first few. Um, so it's not the clever way. You will get an answer, but it's, well, you'll never get the full answer because it will just continue on forever. Okay, so we're at a point now. Yeah, we're on time. Well, we probably know enough to be able to talk about uh, digital filters. I've already given you a hint at how to um, figure out their response, frequency response. The next week we're going to come back and we're going to do it all in a bit more detail. Now remember, I can't teach you everything in a week or two. I mean, I spent 
many weeks learning how to design different types of digital filters. So next week we're just going to do a, a basic intro and get, get you to a point where you understand the different types of filter, um, roughly what their behavior is, and you're able to use the MATLAB design tools to be able to build your own filter. You won't necessarily understand, you know, be able to do all of them from first principles, but you'll know enough, I think, by the end of next week. Just to get us started in that sort of mindset about designing filters, we're going to just cover some very basics here and then I'll set you up for the lab and then we'll go and write some, write some MATLAB code. Okay, so now we have a digital filter which will be characterized by its coefficients, B of K, which you don't know what that is yet. Hang on a second. B of K and A of K. The output will be y of n, and the input, almost as always, is x of n. Now what are those b and a values? Well, they are the weights in a what's called a difference equation. So this is a kind of convolution. So for compactness, we use a summation. Let me just stop here before I finish it. This is a filter. This is a special type of filter which is called a finite impulse response. And the reason is it only has weights applied to the input values. So what happens is the inputs come in, they get weighted based on where they are in time. So you can see it's this, this delay happening. So the, the, the zeroth weight goes by the most recent sample and the first weight after that goes by the next most recent sample in time and so it goes. So we just look back in time across the signal. But a finite distance back in time, we go across m plus one, we've got something from zero to m, which is m plus one terms. And once the signal sails through, the, input, the output from the, the system will return to zero. So it has a finite impulse, a finite response um, in time, and it will, if, if the input goes away, the output goes away. Now, infinite impulse response, any system which has recursion or feedback won't, will never behave like that. And all real systems are, do behave in that way, are, are sort of have an inherent recursion. So we can add on this other term to make it more complicated. Um, I'm going to change the variable here because people get confused. I'm going to change this to L, going from 1 to L, big L, A of L, Y of N minus L. Now things get interesting because we are using the previous outputs of the filter to generate the next output. And this has the behavior that it, can, it will go on forever. So even if you give it a kick, you give it one input and then take the input away, it will feed back into itself for all time and generate values forevermore. Now, just a little subtlety is that we obviously can't use the most recent output well because we're trying to generate it at the moment. So the difference in these summations is that this one uses the input and can go from the most recent input, so talking about now, this input right now to generate the output now. When we look at the output values, we can only use the previous output value. So this sum goes from 1 and not from 0. So this is our difference equation. If you did the Z transform, I've already told you this, and it's in the notes if you want to go and have a look. Um, you'll get y of z is equal to, sorry, it's k, k equal to 0 up to m of b of k is z to the minus k divided by 1 plus l equal to 1 up to big L a of k, a of l, sorry, a of l, can't write, 
uh, z to the minus l. All multiplied by x of z. So that's quite convenient, and this would look familiar to you, so we would normally write this as h of z, x of z. So if this is a system, we could also describe it by its transfer function, h of z. So I've given you a difference equation, I might say to you, hey, I've got a piece of software that has some, some difference equation in it that seem to be taking the input signal, weighting it, and adding it to the output, and also weighting the previous outputs from the system. What kind of filter is it, I wonder? And you would say, well, no problem, just give me the coefficients of the, the ones that are weighting the inputs. They're the B coefficients, they're going to be in the numerator and give me the coefficients of the one that are weighting the previous outputs and you put them into this equation uh, which ge generates, it's a bit opaque now but maybe I'll, in the next line I'll write it out um, this is a, a polynomial in Z and this is a polynomial in Z on the bottom and we'll be able to understand how it behaves by looking at its poles and roots if you didn't want to go and look at poles and roots you could just plug in the e to the j omega t and that's what we're going to do in the lab um, so yeah, let's, let's just expand it, let's see if I can fit it here. So you're going to get B0 plus B1, Z to the minus 1, plus bum bum bum, all the way up to B of M, Z to the minus M. I've run out of space. And on the bottom, you get a 1 plus a1, z2 minus 1, plus bum 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 up to a of l, z to the minus l. So there we have a polynomial, a ratio of polynomials. The roots of the top one we'll call the zeros when we talk about them next week, and the roots of the bottom will be the poles. Now, We're almost there. Yep, okay. So here we are. I'm just going to take a bird's eye view now of what the system is that we've, we've been working towards for the last couple of weeks. We will have let's call this digital digital filtering of analog signals. So there's a bit of refresher material in here. Uh, so we would have started with some X of T, continuous in time, goes into what we call a sampler. You don't need to concern yourself too much about what that is, but um, you can have a look in the notes. There's a simple diagram. There's many different ways to build these circuits. They just grab values of voltage on the circuit every uh, T seconds. And we get a bunch of numbers, which is our x of n. And then maybe we want to filter that signal, so we send it into our digital filter. This is our system. And out of that we get, so maybe let's draw some pictures we had over here. Perhaps x of t looks like this. At this point here, I mean really what, at this point here what we have is a bunch of numbers in memory registers in the computer. We don't have what we're going to draw, but mathematically we, we imagine that what we have for analysis purposes are samples of that signal. So we have some delta functions, this is our x of n. 
and then it goes through a filter and some magic happens we'll, we'll wait inputs and outputs and we'll get something else so that'll be the output y of n and maybe that looks different perhaps it goes like this and then I think Robert will deal next week with um, reconstruction filter and you get a y of t coming out of there which is now looks like that against time this is y of n so I think next week Robert's going to talk to you a little bit about reconstruction filters you can have a look in my notes as well if you want to know more about it um, just to draw some quick pictures to tell you what's happening for each of these we had um, yeah let's go this way squeeze them in imagine the magnitude of x or j omega and I'm just going to make this up that it looks like this so perhaps I had some x of t continuous in time I take its Fourier transform and that's what it looks like wonderful and it's band limited thankfully so when I sample it if I sample at the Nyquist rate which is twice this maximum frequency then I won't get any overlap or aliasing in the spectrum and I'm in good, good stead after I sample it that will be x bar j omega I will get copies so I get this but then I get copies at multiples of the sampling frequency so that was omega s I'll have another one here we did all this last week with replication to be another one down here and so on in both directions forever and that will be scaled if that was an amplitude of a this will be a over t which I can't draw but we also know that this is equal to the Z transform evaluated at e to the j omega t or another way we know it is the discrete time for a transform so this is the sample signal x of n will look like this it will be replicated across the, the multiples of the sampling frequency and if I had the Z transform of that input signal then um, I would just evaluate it e to j omega t which is what something we're going to do today um, then maybe the filter does something in the frequency domain which is pleasing to us so perhaps it's a low pass filter and it cuts out those side lobes so maybe we end up with something like this for y so this would be y bar at j omega again is equal to the Z transform evaluated on the unit circle so that's a discrete time for a transform and I won't deal much with it but um, let's put that down Robert will talk a bit about it next week which is a reconstruction filter so when we have when we're at this point here and we want to get the signal back in the analog domain if you look it's easier to, to imagine what's happening when you look at the spectrum you think oh here's the spectrum with this bizarre forever repeating behavior um, it's pretty obvious that if you want to get this part out this is the you know a signal from continuous time just has some spectrum over a finite range so you want to get just this bat part back out then you use a low pass filter in reality we don't have a machine that can generate impulses like this that's not what we do uh, we tend to just hold a voltage at a constant value so you get a staircase approximation um, we can model that behavior and that does something very funny where it puts zeros in the middle of all of the copies of the spectra but it's a real signal a real voltage changing like a staircase and then we low pass filter that so there's a few little implementation tricks along the way analytically you can just think about it um, as if you could 
generate a voltage that looks like that, but you can't. Now, the reason I show you this, we're going to focus on the middle two. Um, this is what defines the system, the behavior, the frequency response of the system, because uh, a transfer function is a ratio of the output to the input. So you'll often see y is equal to h times x, but if you rearrange it, you get h is equal to y divided by x. So if I wanted to look at these two and say what was the transfer function, it would be the y value divided by the x value. So I could draw in the middle here what the transfer function would be. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to write down some equations to allow you to go and calculate it. This is almost repetitive now at this stage. Um, digital filter uh, frequency response. So in the continuous time, we have a transfer function. And that is, by definition, the ratio of so, it is, so this is pure continuous time, right? No sampling, no nothing. It, the definition of a transfer function of a linear system will be the transform of the output variable divided by the transform of the input variable. Now we've sampled the signal, so we're not, we're somewhat restricted. We have the sample spectrum. Which is repetitive, so it's periodic, it's got this replication happening. So really we can only think about the range from the range in between the sampling frequency, so less than half the sampling frequency. So this is for omega less than or equal to omega s over 2, greater than or equal to minus omega s over 2. Now what, what do I mean by that? I just mean that the thing is repeating again and again, so why bother going past half the sampling frequency because I'm just going to get the same answer again. So even though the thing repeats forever, we just zoom in and focus on that, that range of operation where we do our filtering right in the middle. And I've already told you that that's also equivalent to the Z transform. Um, for Z equal to E to the J omega T. And again, in that range in the middle. So, oh. here we have our definitions, h of z, and z equal to e to the j omega t is the frequency response. And there I write it. Yeah, I guess we're going to do this today. h, that'd be tilde. Of e to the j omega t is the amplitude response of magnitude response and the angle of that is the phase response or free, yeah, phase So this is what we're going to do today. You're going to go into the lab. I'm going to give you a transfer function or a difference equation. I'm going to tell you to calculate the frequency response of that thing. So you're going to implement, you're going to find out by looking at the difference equation, what is this Z transform, um, the transfer function of the, the filter. And then once you're happy with that, you've got the co you've extracted the coefficients. You're going to implement 
this value. So you're gonna. Uh, this sounds complicated, but I'll, I'll, we'll talk through it in the lab. Remember, this is a ratio of polynomials. I think for today it's quite simple. It's only you've only got a numerator. There's no denominator. So it's one polynomial in Z, and then you're gonna evaluate it when Z is equal to e to the j omega t. The only thing in e to the j omega t which is changing is omega. T is fixed. We decide that when we design the system. Omega is the value we can change. Which frequency do I want to evaluate at? Well, that depends uh, um, on what the, the frequency of the input signal is. That's the nature of the frequency response. If I want to know how it's going to, how it's going to filter a, fre a, a particular frequency, I evaluate at that frequency and I see how it's going to be. So today you have two different sinusoids that you have to put in, so that will define the two frequencies that you really care about. But you should write a function to evaluate at, at a whole bunch of frequencies across the spectrum and plot it and see what it looks like. Um, once you get that, it will be a complex number. So you've just taken a polynomial in Z. <coughs> it's going to turn up in the camera, so I'm going to wait till he stops. You take in a polynomial in Z, you put in some complex numbers. So e to the j omega t is, is a complex number. It's going to be like, you know, alpha plus j beta. You plug it in, you work it out, you're going to get a complex number. So it all sounds fantastically complicated, but actually, when you pick a value of omega, the answer for, for h tilde is a complex number. It's something plus j something, and it has a magnitude and it has a phase. The magnitude tells you the gain of the filter at that frequency. So if the signal goes in with an amplitude of 10 and the gain is 1.5, the amplitude is going to be 15 when it comes out on the other end. And the phase will tell you what fraction of a period it gets shifted by. So we've, we've touched on this stuff already in the past. Okay? All right, that brings us to the end. So we'll go take a break, go into the lab, uh, get the manual up for today and open that lab and I'll be with you shortly.